dedicated to Henry Farman. In the years of the primal war, from the war of Terrestrial birth, man mastered the mammoth and horse. Good afternoon, good evening, my friends, good wherever, good whomever, good however I may find you. This is Alan Averill. This is Agitators Anonymous. I think it is episode 155, although I'm not sure. Some of you have been asking me, where is the YouTube video for your critique of the Rolling Stones 100 um, greatest metal songs of all time? Um, I made a video of that, which is why the audio quality was not quite perfect. Um, I'll post the video. I'll post the video. I guess I was just going through a bit of a grumpy period where it felt like low-hanging fruit for a middle-aged man to be um, critiquing such a such a list. Was it beneath me? Obviously not, because I reached up from lying on the ground to pick a, a piece of low-hanging fruit. So I should just put the video out there and suffer the consequences, suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune as people come and critique my critique. Well, 155 episodes. What's happening? It's April the 14th today. Uncle Joe is in town. Uncle Joe is in Dublin. No, not that Uncle Joe. Um, Not Uncle Joe Stalin, but Uncle Joe Biden, um, who said that he was finally home once he got here. He's actually apparently staying about 100 metres from where I'm living. So I have extended the invitation for him to come down and discuss uh, 1980 South American black thrash. Um, Waiting on that, waiting on that. So until that comes through, I'm hoping, I'm hoping he will be excited by the prospect of listening to my original, original copy on vinyl of Sarcophago. Sarcophago, I, I, I N R I or INRI, as some people call it. I even told him I had the Cogumilla Warfare noise sampler and that he should come down and check it out because those two versions of the Sarcophago songs on there um, are beyond, are beyond the beyond. Um, so I'm waiting on that invitation to see if he comes down. Until then, you'll just have to put up with me waffling whatever nonsense I am talking about. And there's a lot of things that I want to talk about today. What I want to discuss is the implications for AI art. Um, A couple of interesting things, a discussion between myself and Paul McCarroll. Um, You may remember Paul. He worked on, if you're, um, you know, if you're a primordial nerd or you know your primordial stuff, he worked, he was in the Irish band Scald, a very cool band that maybe you should go and have a look at. But he did the primordial covers to The Nameless Dead and he did Redemption. But he's come back on the fold, come back on board to take up the new primordial album, which I must admit looks very, very striking. You're going to see the artwork very soon. But we had an interesting discussion about AI. And I said, Paul, can I use this discussion in the podcast today? And he said, OK. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to actually go through the back and forth between me and him. I think we we certainly fundamentally degree degree agree we agree on the implications for art and artists but we were i was asking different questions of him about those implications um and i think that they're very interesting to discuss um before i get to that i will say that the podcast is sponsored by metalblade.com you can go to indiemerch.com slash metalblade records and you can use the promo code aa2023 for 10 percent off the links will be below in the description and if any of you and i'm getting hit up by quite a lot of you are looking for a backdrop for your band summer festival season coming up um hit me up in the dms or just send me an email or just contact me and i can forge you onto the backdrop guys um i'm getting quite a few of those uh requests every week and they are great they're you know they're light they're fireproof which is the big thing um they are all connected with eyelets and all this kind of stuff so if you ever seen a band like for example rod in christ i was looking at last weekend at dark easter metal meeting and they have all these cool backdrops if you think you need that for your band hit me up and give me um give me a message and i'll put you across to the people in charge someone asked me what are the noises going on in the background of the podcast yes dublin city is being ripped up at the moment um there was a police station at the end of the road and it is being devoured by those kind of like heavy metal pincers those kind of teeth claw things um just smashing the shit out of everything and the whole street is just debris and dust and you know what do they call that the mold of an industrial horizon wasn't that the name of a seven inch by let me think heavy metal nerdism coming in here i think it was the band hibernoid didn't they have a seven inch called mold of an industrial horizon um old uk sort of 
what would you call it, industrial doom band from the early 90s. Quite an interesting band. Never went anywhere, really, sadly, but they were pretty good. They were pretty good. So let's discuss AI and the implications for this. Now, some of this was prompted um, by a discussion on my Patreon, which, by the way, is patreon.com slash Alan Avril. If you want to go over and support the show, go and have a look. But we were discussing this band, um, Frostbite Orc Kings. Now, it feels a bit... I'm going to be honest with you, a bit daft as a musician for over 30 years to be like, again, the low-hanging fruit. And this is really low-hanging fruit. But I think on some level it is very important. Um, Frostbite Orc Kings, as somebody sent me a message about, um, are an only, like an, an AI band. Basically, I think they have one guy um, who is, maybe it's a couple of dudes. I am looking at a at his face now on a YouTube interview with Nick Nocturnal podcast. Um, I watched a bit of it. And basically, he's the guy who's putting in the information and driving the train, shall we say. But it's an AI-created band, um, and they're orcs, and they have this whole thing around them. And I'm sure it's designed to sell NFTs or sell a computer game or something or other. But what are the implications for real bands if this stuff starts to take more and more hold? Because um, listening to the song, what struck me is now it's not the kind of heavy metal i like it's bad heavy metal um in that it's the kind of awful it's a kind of awful stuff that you hear in the afternoon unfortunately um at vac and open air when you know that by by you know by rights it should be the lord weird slough fag up there on the main stage at four or five p.m but the world doesn't work like that and so it's beast in black or beyond the black or some shit like this which is just you know cookie cutter stuff um and unfortunately frostbite or king sounds almost exactly like it would be at home on the main stage at some festivals not to besmirch those festivals whatever i've always had a great time playing varkin i'm not gonna diss it um and look if you know you all know that if you want to hear some cool music you go into the tent at varkin and then you wait for the probably the headliner is going to be something cool anyway that's not my point my point is frostbite orc kings it sounds like the kind of thing that could already be kind of huge and it is already huge its views and its listenership on spotify is greater than most bands are able to get so what are the implications for this because this this i mean i'm i'm fine with this existing in a world alongside musicians and alongside heavy metal but how is it going to be in another 12 or 24 or 36 months when um, the landscape is changing so rapidly for what AI can do. I mean, are we discussing, are we looking at the potentiality within, um, let's say not this year's summer festival season, but the festival season of summer 2024, where Frostbite or Kings are going to actually be playing at Hellfest as projections on the main stage at like 4 p.m. And, um, you know, younger people who maybe have grown up, you know, attached to this technology so much are not going to see the sort of dreadful implications for arts and artists, artists um, as vividly as somebody like me would. Um, is that possible? Because that could just mean that, you know, you don't need... Um, think about that. You can just basically send Hellfest a file. Here is what you need to do. Um, you're going to need this projector um, or send one guy um, with that projector or whatever as the technical advisor Um not sure how it would work on a huge stage to project something from that distance, but certainly there's got to be some way around it. Erect a screen. I'm not sure how it would work, but something could work. Listen, if you can send Dio out on tour as uh, the projection of himself from 1985, you can surely do this. So what does that mean? Well, it means as a booking agent, you can just book, um, you can collect the fee and book a file. Well, you don't really need a booking agent, do you? If you're the guy from Frostbite or Kings, you can do it yourself. There's no luggage. There's no um, drunken, moronic band members to worry about. Have they got out on the booze the night before? Are they going to make that 7 a.m. red-eye airport call? Um, what are the implications for, um, fundamentally, for a couple of years down the road? Could we have big bands retire? You saw probably recently the big argument between Mick Mars and Motley Crue. Could Motley Crue still tour um, in five or ten years and none of them be there? I mean, in theory, this is what could actually happen. Of course, in theory, AI could possibly also make a new Motley Crue album in a couple of years. Um, and it could also do so unprompted. It could do so prompted by a fan. Um, yeah, the implications are kind of brain-breaking. So fundamentally, 
it's got some sort of there's some sort of dread that musicians existentially feel i certainly feel it when i watch this frostbite or king's videos like oh wow it's getting close this is getting close and this so this sounds like an awful lot of heavy metal that already exists that is really popular heavy metal and is it going to bother um you know somebody who's who's kind of grown up on you know nonsense like death clock or whatever already accepts the parameters that well look who cares um why shouldn't this be exist alongside musicians the problem is is that i suppose when you dig down to it just beneath the surface what other things is it going to take from musicians um i think the the process of this is not it's going to be really really uh, revealed over the next year or two or three i would say within the three years how is this going to change the musical landscape the landscape of music but also how we absorb music how music is written how music is recorded i mean somebody just handed me um, Dread Sovereign just played last weekend at Dark Eater Easter Metal Meeting and I forgot that I re- I'd arranged this show to be recorded with three cameras and they just sent me all the camera angles and they sent me um, some stem audio files. That's the bass, the guitars and the drums that went into the front of house. Now, I was looking at this going, oh, this is such a headache and my mate just said to me, hey man, you know, you can just send that to um, basically like a uh, an AI mixing um platform and it can just do it for you tell it what you want it to sound like and i was like okay that my again my i'm sort of um wrangling with the moral implications of that because my first instinct was to go and talk to my friend um you know shawnee um who helped record the last dread sovereign and all sorts of the things like that you might have seen him on the tour with primordial and um, standing in for kieran for some of the dates and he um my instinct is to go to him to, of course, to a real person, to a real conversation. But theoretically, I could just get, um, you know, download a platform and get AI to mix this for me and probably edit the camera angles as well. Now, you may, as well as I do, remember the ar- the argument about AI and automation five or ten years ago was that you probably heard people like Joe Rogan talking about this when he was talking about UBI, universal basic income, which I think was a fundamental misunderstanding of the concept of UBI. I think that too many people considered universal basic income would be just an analog thing, not a digital thing, because universal basic income, I think, fundamentally can be very, very dangerous because it can be programmed. There can be param- digital parameters programmed into it it i.e it gives the um the powers that be a great control over what you spend your money on it's not just hey guys here's 200 you know here's 300 quid um you know into your hand go and do what you want with it it's going to be programmed and it's going to tell you you can't take that flight you can't eat this you can't do that that's what that's the dangers of universal basic income but the principles that they were discussing were that humanity was somehow going to be set free to be able to concentrate on creativity because AI and automation was going to take the labor intensive um, work, you know, the labor intensive jobs out of uh, society. And it was going to g- give us all time to do things creatively. But now we see the parameters are shifting and that AI will be able to take those creative jobs as well. It can do. Um, all of those things, fundamentally, they're all those creative jobs. I mean, friends of mine who are working in the um, the design industry, where five years ago they had um, a phalanx, a, a you know, a great support of graphic artists and people creating and things are all being fired. They're all being let go because they aren't needed anymore. Everything is now slimming down. Whereas, of course. Um, is automation and AI going to take the the grim tasks of coltan mining out of the mines in the in the you know the Democratic Republic of Congo? Probably not so much, um, sadly. In that, I doubt that um, AI and automation is going to liberate um, you know and transform the third world, so to speak, and you know liberate people working there under terrible conditions from some of the. Um, from some of the things that they are, you know, being paid pittance for m- that are being mined and created for our our sort of luxury uh, form of living in the West, our, that they stabilize our luxury belief system. You know what I mean? I mean, I mean, where do you think that some of the raw materials for batteries for your uh, electric cars and all the sort of luxury belief system that surrounds the implication, the implications therein of that and the uh, potential enforcement of that? Um, Anyway, look, that's <laughs> that's a different podcast. Let don't don't sidetrack me now. I'm talking about artificial intelligence in creativity. 
But I was reading a an article in the BBC. Um, it does happen sometimes, but they were discussing in a sort of very airy kind of way the idea that there might be 320 million jobs potentially lost um, through AI and automation. 320 million. Now, if I'm not incorrect, that's about 100 million short of the amount of people who live in the Eurozone. So we're talking about, I mean, Ireland has a pop, you know, this is. Well, let's say this is um, how many people live in England? I don't know, 60 million or something like this. So we're talking about five and a half times the population of the United Kingdom just being made unemployment by AI. And it's sort of breezily discussed. Well, there'll be other jobs. And I was thinking to myself, well, what will those other jobs be? Um, what will they be? Because the article didn't really really lay out what they could be. It merely went back into the past and said, well, you know, after the Second World War, there were all these jobs created, So society and society had to readjust to the 1950s after the Second World War, just as it did in the 1920s in the Great Depression, and there were all these other jobs and employment sectors created. Um, and my brain was sort of breaking a bit reading this, going like, wow, okay, well, let's project into the future because the what we're talking, you know, the, the concept of AI and what it can do, I don't think has technological parallels with the 1950s, certainly not. I mean, the life of your average person in 1995, technologically speaking, was closer to someone in 1955 than um, 1995 is to now. I very much think so. And certainly will be very far removed in 1995 from um, how life may be in 2025. Now, what they're calling it, I suppose, is the fourth industrial revolution, um, which sort of is a bit unusual because it uses the word industrial. I suppose what they should call it is the new technological revolution or something like this, or the first um, digital revolution maybe sounds better. I mean, there is this course, this sort of masochistic view of the Industrial Revolution as being something um, that was terrible for humankind. But don't forget the Industrial Revolution. I think it's a misreading of history because don't forget the Industrial Revolution um, gave regular people a way out of serfdom. I mean, it destroyed the old monarchical system, um, the first and the second estate, as they would have called it, after in, I think, in French revolutionary terms, we, you know, um, the monarchy and the church on those and their power on those terms, if I have not um, completely butchered that, um, is that uh, that observation? Um, because it uh, allowed normal people um, roots into the process of distribution um, of and uh, of industrial finance, which allowed them to lift themselves out of poverty. I mean, the alternative to what? The Industrial Revolution not happening would be what? That the tiny percentage of people who just ruled by divine right of inheritance just kept on ruling. Now, some would say they still do. And, yeah, you know, there is that argument. But the Industrial Revolution certainly altered society. And if you go back and read even things like the Communist Manifesto, um, which was, what, 1848 or something like this? I mean, there were um, there was attempted revolutions in 19, 1850 and 1851, I think, across Europe, which failed. But, I mean, say what you want about Marx and the reasons why at different periods in time he's popular and not popular. I would say he's more popular in times when things seem uh, much more... Um, unjust or uneven um, within society. Um, and if you pinpoint our, you know, economic collapse of 2008 and then the last 10 years of social media um, derangement and aggregate them together and now the current cost of living crisis. And yes, I can see why it would make sense that people take a, you know, delve back into something like the Communist Manifesto. Am I losing you? Am I losing you? No, but I would go and read it. I'm not advocating, of course, for, for Marxism, but what I'm saying is it's complicated. And I'm saying that um, there is a certain misreading of the uh, uh, sort of historically illiterate mis misreading of the process of the Industrial Revolution and what it did to emancipate people. And I think that there is a kind of masochistic view amongst um, middle or upper class um, Western set of society who hold what I would consider luxury belief systems that have sort of um, recast um, the Industrial Revolution as... Um, anyway, back to the AI discussion. Back to the AI discussion, I hear you. But I will say this. If this article in the BBC is even, even remotely correct... And 320 million people potentially could be replaced or have their jobs taken. I, I would say it's kind of like this. If we consider the um, the Industrial Revolution 
on one level, people went from being used, as in they were used by the industry, they were used by society to be, to be cogs in this machine. I mean, you have no, you could really look no greater. Um, you know, you can look at communist society, um, Stalinist society, whatever you want is the great example of that. People were just cogs in a very, very big machine. But people could potentially go from being used to useless. Now, what do useless people do? I think they agitate, right? Um, because I think the post-pandemic world, we're never going back to normality as we knew it the same way. Um, now, some of you may not observe that at all or may not agree with that. This is fine. But the idea that, well, the sort of, uh, I, I, let's say the vague hint, there's a hint here, right, which is this, that the powers that be, if we consider them, understand or understood more clearly than most of the public that the potentiality for what AI could remove from society, people going from used to useless and the potential for agitation, well then you probably observed that in your country during lockdown um, each government introduced many, many new laws for the police, anti-protest laws, um, rules against, you know, they're really designed to keep people, well that's locked down, that's the clue is in the name, locked inside society. Um, they, You could see many, many Western leaders sort of casting um, covetous glances at the Chinese social currency system because how else are you going to control people and keep them within their, uh, their radius, their boxes, if they're also proving to be useless as this AI automotive society might render them? That's a very dangerous place for society to be where... As this article stated, hundreds of millions of people are literally have nothing to do. What is their income? There we now we return back to universal basic income and the program digital concept of your universal basic income, which has parameters and those parameters are linked and defined by a social currency system in order to keep people in place. Now, of course. The pod, uh, podcast is called Agitators Anonymous. This is the kind of thing that fascinates and interests me. It's not the podcast is not called Asher. It'll be grand. Asher, will you stop worrying? I think those podcasts already exist. And you know, if you're the kind of person who listens to a podcast called Asher, it'll be grand. You're not listening to one called Agitators Anonymous. And some of you have wondered where did the politics go from the last couple of episodes? It's been lurking behind. It's been lurking in the brain. But look, let's be honest, you have to sometimes free yourself from audience capture and not just um, keep rehashing the same ground. And I think, um, you know, the last six or nine or 12 months, a lot of interesting things have been happening in the music industry. And that's just been more interesting to talk about the music industry than um, just going over and over the same politics. But I would say that this era that potentially we're moving into, this AI um, automation in um, area, is already beginning to have a huge impact. Like, look look at chat GPT. I mean, how is the education system going to cope with chat GPT? How are teachers who are going to be way behind students in their understanding of technolo technology be able to um, gatekeep this? This is the, the, uh, the idea that how do we gatekeep? Now, you, now I would say that the powers that be have already, of course, identified that. That is why you're hearing words like misinformation and disinformation, um, hate speech, etc. I'll put in along with that because these are I, these are all concepts that are um, circling around the carcass of um, well, the carcass of free speech, but also of social control because you need control of those things if we're heading for this um, very disruptive world. This this we're heading out of a period of calm, which let's say was the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, the emergent of the new uh, middle class across the West, let's say 1991, 92 on until about the, uh, the collapse in 2008, 2009. That was a period of relative, I think, um, peace for, and, you know, upward mobility for various sectors of the West. Now, of course, if you come from a country where that was not so, you will say, uh, fuck you, Averill, that was not so. And yeah, you're probably right. But... That's not really my point. I think we are potentially entering. Um, we've just we've we've had a decade now of social media derangement. So now we're moving into, I think, some other form of digital derangement. And remember all those people a couple of years ago who were like, "Learn to code, learn to code." Um, who were busy, you know. I suppose it was a sort of middle class digital pajama party ideal that you talk down to analog people, the working class. It now seems rather. 
um, the the let's say the um, smirk might be on the other side of the face or whatever. God, I butchered that, didn't I? Um, people might be laughing inside of faces as those people who said said things like "Oh, learn to code" are now going to f- are facing joblessness or uselessness. And it seems now that picking fights with truck drivers who deliver food seems a little unwise, doesn't it? Because they say we're only three or four. Is it three days away from a zombie apocalypse if food isn't delivered? Hmm. And who is trying to um, uh, who is trying to take over the method of food production? Well, it's probably at the moment areas of your government in the West, isn't it? Hmm. Anyway, but that's another podcast. So I'm going to discuss this conversation between me and Paul McCarroll. The idea really is, is that he is an artist um, uh, uh, and a sticks and stones will break my bones, you know, living, breathing artist. Um, He's been doing it for decades. And the implications for what's happening, I suppose, are being written in very big letters on the wall. And this is the back and forth between me and Paul discussing this. And I suppose what's underpinning this is the worry that will anyone really care? I mean, um, to me, at least, we saw very clearly during lockdown and the pandemic what art meant or artists or musicians or all these kinds of things. It meant fuck all. Um, it, you had no leverage. It was literally, your world is over now, um, and that's just the way it is. And so I think that very much scared an awful lot of people. Um, of course it did, but it scared in, in different ways than people concerned about health and safety or whatever. I, of course, I'm talking about this from musicians' artistic perspective. But many artists saw, like, okay, we saw how that was worth, and now as we're moving into this automotive um, conversation, the AI conversation, there are other conversations, but they're underpinned by the same unease. They're underpinned by unease. Because obviously, if you're a band and you don't have much money, and we can trace that back to um, Spotify. I mean, Spotify, as I said before, is a model for very much of modern society. Now, the idea that you own nothing and you will be happy, as in, you know, I was only discussing this yesterday with um, with a guy um, who was a hip hop dance music DJ in the early '90s and about vinyl collecting and stuff. And we're talking about what happens when there's no more cool parents. I inherited fifty or sixty vinyls from my parents. Cool stuff: Fairport Convention, Steel Ice Band, Chuck Berry, um, all sorts of you know proper music. But that, but they're they're corporeal. You can feel them. You can pick them up. You looked at them. Now, what do people inherit? Nothing. Um, a login link to Spotify. Um, it's again this you will own nothing principle Um, and so apply this to property apply this to food apply this to many things and I think that that's underpinning what's happening so what prompted this discussion between me and Paul was a YouTube link and it's called The End of Art An Argument Against Image AIs Um, and what Paul basically says um, and he makes what he makes is a very interesting point and this is what we discuss in the conversation Um, you know, a friend of mine made on Mid Journey about 10 album covers one afternoon. And the truth is that, 90, that all of them looked better than 98% of almost all metal album covers um, that there is. Almost all of them. And then you probably read that the artist who did Megadeth um, last album cover was in some sort of legal dispute for $20,000 or something for that cover. Let's be honest. My friend could have made that cover better on mid journey in about half an hour judging by the standard and quality of the things he was making um and what i was trying to meant to say before i was sidetracked there was who if we trace this back to spotify um, and the lack of money from musicians in the system who could blame them in a way for going you know what i can generate this cover by myself and i've messed around with canva which is not you know which is a kind of dummy version of mid journey Um, you know, you can admit Journey for Dummies. And I put in stuff like, you know, in the style of William Blake, in the style of this, that, the other, blah, blah. blah. And of course, mentally, um, it didn't really, what Paul is about to say now didn't really, um, it didn't really get through to me. Um, Because, of course, I picked William Blake, who's been dead for like 200 years. But what if I'd picked a modern artist? What if I'd picked Paul McCarroll himself and said, to AI, I want a new primordial album in the style of Paul McCarroll, who made, and Paul McCarroll, by the way, made the Blood Revolt in Doctrine album cover, which is one of my favourite pieces of art. Um, the album I made with the guys from Revenge, if you want to go and check out the cover. But um, 
I could have gone back and said to AI, and of course the parameters are there. All you have to do is teach it, tell it where we pointed in the direction to go. Um, a new primordial album in the vein of Paul McCarroll, um, and given it some images and things to play with, and it probably could have come up with something. So, what happens for the band who have absolutely no money or no inclination or no um, no desire to just kind of stick to the principles of working with other artists and just go, you know what? I haven't got the time, money and space for this. Here's the lyrics. Here's the idea. He- here are my influences. Go with it. So Paul says, um, some of it is pretty cool, but it really is bollocks. And the worst thing is it's harvesting other people's work to do it. Now, this is an interesting word, harvesting other people's work. And that's what got me thinking. And you'll you'll hear my response. And in a facsimile way, stealing the identity and style of people who've worked hard to develop for years. Everything is being made disposable. Now, I mean, that's an, I, would dig- I would agree with that. It's been made disposable for years and years. Digital artists are fucked. Yeah, Paul doesn't mince his words here. And even analog artists, illustrators too, really. And so this is where the end of art, I'll post the link on it, you should watch that. Now what I've said to him uh, back is um, that you can understand a band wanting to save money and all this when they make so little anyway. So in theory, AI can generate their artwork for them in two minutes. They should be able to make a cheap free video um, for more or less nothing. In fact, you should be able to place your own avatar within to, into a video that you know AI has created for you. Um, the mixing, the mixing, the mastering, all this stuff could in theoretically be done by AI. And as I said to him, a decade or at least five years ago, people were told that AI automation would remove the tedious jobs and the labor. But, but here it is about to replace the creative jobs. Um, so Paul then sent me a long answer, which I'm going to read out because it's very interesting. We're going to discuss what he means because I think it's a perfect example. You've got an artist which is primordial working with another artist um, and Paul pencil, you know, he drew out and penciled the cover and everything um, out, of a, out of a photograph of an idea I had. Um, and... So it's all analog process, it's people talking to each other. And you're perfectly aware that theoretically already the pro- the principle, or not the principle, theoretically the process could be, I we make our album, um, I have an idea for the, for the artwork and the cover, I contact, contact, I use Mid Journey and go in the style of Paul McCarroll who made the album artworks in the two th- mid 2000s, I want this and blah, blah, blah. And it will, it will make that. Now, he says, Alex of HMA asked me the question for Snakes Mag. Um, and this is what Paul says. Now, you may say, why isn't Paul on the podcast? Now, I don't think that's really Paul's style, to be honest, although I will ask him to come on and discuss this. But I'm going to read out his answer and we're, I'm going to you know, go through it. He says, the more I look and understand the mechanics of it, the more I see that AI is not a tool for, but more potentially a replacement for visual creators. Illustrator J.K. Potter had a bit of a niche with his fantastic darkroom photo collage work in the 80s and early 90s, a real visionary. The emergence of photo image manipulation software pretty much pushed him away. People were able to create the same effects faster and easier. But to make worthwhile imagery, this still required an actual human to learn skills, use their understanding and and imagination and some artistic talent. Now, let's just think about that for a second. Because the word here is convenience, right? So much of our modern world and our modern relationship to technology is is couched in the vein of, hey, it's convenient. It's convenient. Well, I'll tell you what, one thing about this huge centralized um, digital landscape we're creating, whereby you are your phone. Everything is convenient until your phone doesn't work. What happens if there is a massive um, cyber attack and the internet goes down? I mean, uh, everything potentially could go down if there is no, if there is no, um, if there is no cash in your pocket, if everything is linked all to the same digital systems, one th- theoretically, one cyber attack could just lower everything. How do people pay for this? How do people pay for that? How do they um, get from A to B? I si- I'm, side- I'm sidetracking myself again, but consider that. Surely the next pandemic will be a cyber pandemic. Anyway, mark my words. Um, okay, so where is Paul with this? Any visual artist's most valuable asset is his or her visual identity. Yep, certainly agree with that. The personal style that takes years of person v- perseverance, imagination, talent, personality and experience to develop a unique, recognisable legacy. V- I mean, Paul's words here are really, really interesting. They're really, really great. And what I made, what I thought about was, yeah, you've, you, like me, I've developed my singing voice for years and years. 
what if someone else was just able to go um, to, you know, if Frostbite Orc Kings said, you know, I want a chorus in the style of Alan Averill. And the, out came the chorus, and I'm sure they probably can, in the style of Al Averill. How would I feel about that? It's a, but it, The fact that it's a sound is a little bit different than a visual, but you've still worked on your personal identity um, for years and years, and it can just take it just like that. The personal style that takes years of perseverance, imagination, talent, personality, um, a recognizable legacy. Sorry, I've just repeated the word. Well, anyway. Whether you are a top gallery artist or a hobbyist, sharing your sketches with your friends and family, to have your work harvested en masse, to have your personal style stolen without any sort of recognition, permission or recompense is frankly disgusting. I agree with it. I agree with that statement, Paul. Um, visual creators are being stripped of the ownership of their work and worth. Illustrators, artists, concept designers, photographers, storyboarders, costume and fashion designers, on and on. I can think of even more people than that. What about your holiday snaps or medical photos? These insidious companies, insidious, a very good word, have been allowed to freely steal everyone's visual property for vast profit. Well, they've been stealing our our data for years. And so that's the thing is that um, the, you've probably seen those frustrating uh, video clips of um, politicians trying to get their heads around what's happening with some of these platforms and they're, they're asking such inane questions about that you can tell they're 10, 15 years behind the technology and these are the people who are supposed to make laws to protect your um, your data. You know that the, the, the horse is already far, far, far um, years ago bolted. Anyway, where are we here now? Okay. The fair use argument is worthless. I agree with you, unfortunately, Paul. As it's already been stated by others, would the film or music industry allow this harvesting of their property? Let's type in and generate a new 70 Zero Black Sabbath album. We've discussed that in the podcast, of course, as well. Of course not. AI music already exists, but only with permitted, non-copyrighted material. Mm, interesting. I, I, again, the complex thing with that, Paul, is... Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm replying to his own statement is that I think normal punters are going to be create are going to be able to create these albums themselves. Then what happens? Like, um, let's say the technology exists in a, uh, two years for just a normal punter to go, well, I want a new Fleetwood Mac album, but I want the original lineup and then I want this person. And, you know, you could be able to pick and choose what musicians in the style of in the studio you want. And so there could be there could be 20 new Beatles albums. Um, in one month, it, it, theoretically. Try and wrap your head around that. Or personalised stylus. So do other people get to hear them? I'm not sure how you gatekeep that. Are the music industry is going to be able to gatekeep that? And we can trace it back to Spotify because there's a direct link from what Spotify tried to do and people who were not, in my opinion, musicians or creative people, um, uh, argued against. They, they wanted that. They had this utopian, idealistic view that everything should be everything for free. But of course, now we see the kind of society that that creates. OK, so let me get back to what Paul says. Where is the protection for visual artists? Um, where is it? I, th I, I guess it's nowhere, Paul. And I, but I would say there is no protection for all artists or else I would be um, probably able to pay my rent from Spotify um, and the millions of plays that I have up there. But of course, I'm not. Um. We didn't opt into this. This is it. This is it. We didn't opt into any of this. Uh, we are running behind the cart. Um, we are, uh, you know, like one of those old Western movies where you see the two old um, guys on the little train track with the little, I don't know what you call it, pneumatic um, seesaw going back and forward. We're, we're those two guys as a society, as a creative society, trailing after um, a train speeding off into the distance. Um, we ain't catching up. We ain't catching up. Um, I'm not sure we're even going to get to the next station. Um, but anyway, we didn't opt into this. Many arguments have been voiced more eloquently and concisely than I ever could. A good starting point on technical, legal and moral aspects would be the excellent artist Stephen Zapato's video, The End of Art, an argument against image AIs, which definitely um, go and watch that. Maybe I can offer a likely scenario relative to metal culture. Um, and this is interesting because this is then what me and Paul discussed um, let's pick a well-known and distinctive artist. Let's say Dan Seagrave. Now, Dan Seagrave did Altars of Madness. He did um, Malevolent Creation, Entombed, Left Hand Path. Lots of famous art from the um, early 90s. You could say Edward Repka, who did all the classic Scream Bloody Gore, Nuclear Assault. Those brilliantly painted artworks from the 80s and the 90s. Go and Google Ed, Ed Repka 
or Dancing Grave if you don't know what I'm talking about. But otherwise, think of Scream Bloody Gore, Left Hand Path. Now, what could happen is theoretically. Um, oh, actually, I'll, I'll continue with um, I'll continue with Paul's uh, answer here before I disappear off into the ether with my um, blah 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 blah. Um, Seagrave, Dan Seagrave, a recognisable, success, successful and prolific artist. A death metal band on a tiny budget can't afford one of his lovely covers, but they really would like one. Along comes Mr. AI Artist. I can make you a cover like Mr. Seagrave for $30. Or, let's be honest, not even $30. You could probably do it for nothing. Types in the concept and style and ping. Here's a choice of 100 Created without consent, respect or recompense. Dan Seagrave's identity, intellectual property and hard-earned livelihood plucked like a daisy. Just like that. The so-called AI artist gets a few bob and credit for some non-art. And, I, and I'll say, uh, it, just alongside that discussion, is that you don't really need the AI artist. You just need the AI platform. You just need mid-journey. So you can cut out the middleman entirely. You don't need to be a painter. You just literally, with, with Midjourney, you just type in uh, the, the paragraph, the description of what you want, and out it comes. So if you put in, without a doubt, in the style of Dan Seagrave, I want, let's say, a graveyard with this, that, and the other, it will create exactly that. So the so-called AI artist gets a few bob. Okay, well, that might not even exist. The AI companies get their un unregulated exploitation cash. Well, yes, I mean, they're... Um, if you need to pay to upgrade to the most competent version of that platform, then yeah, they will make their money. The ripped off artist gets kicked in the dick. Yeah, in this case of Seagrave, I think he has a dick. And society becomes culturally poor as real artists work is swamped by, by soulless facsimile, without a doubt. Where's the sense of achievement? Well, uh, that's a different question, I think. Where's the joy in the act of creation through imagination, artistic identity and individuality? And of and what of the next generation of visual artists? Why would they even bother? Well, this is this is it. Why would you bother? And when you know when you know that um, when you know already that people who are creators are being shed in, in all industries. I mean, if you're you know without making that you sound particularly gloomy, but if you're if right now you're doing a graphic artist or digital graphic art um, course just forget it go and become a farmer uh, and that's what i would say but th paul says some very interesting things here because what ai does is it's you know we all know those um 15th and 16th century stories about um you know the vermeers and the rembrandts or whoever it is or the, the great artists and they always had understudies who painted for them or learned from the masters um, this this is not really learning. I, I well, it's I suppose it is learning from, but it's harvesting um, the information. But it's not person to person. So what I said to him was, um, how how is this gate kept? Because I said to him, if I as an artist as a painter studied Dan Seagrave's work exactly. Um, like and painted other things in his style, there's technically nothing anyone could do. Is there? I mean, if somebody learned how to sing exactly like me, I mean, are we saying that, um, hey, Ripper Owens, you, you you can't really sing in Judas Priest because what you've done is molded your entire vocal work on Rob Halford circa 84 style. No, we can't really say that because you are allowed to imitate people. You are allowed to be inspired and influenced by. But again, we're talking about Paul's words here. He says inspired. Um, I'm, and I, th I replied to him. I said, I, 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 I agree with you. Um, but sorry I'm clicking here to look at our conversation while I'm doing this um, my my thing here is that is that what are the legal implications for this because people will just say well it's just um, well what can I say if you decide to yourself well I would like this in the style of I've the names I said to him were Picasso and Rembrandt both dead I mean, whose estate are you really hurting? But if you're picture, if you if you are picking somebody like Dan Seagrave, who is still alive, who still obviously, I don't know quite know what he does now, but I think he enjoyed a little renaissance of painting covers again five or ten years ago. But his livelihood it could potentially be removed. Um, I suppose let's take somebody like Elian Krantor, Krator, sorry Elian, a brilliant artist who's done lots of stuff now for Hate Eternal. He has a style that's very much in the vein of a classic. 
uh, painting style of like 17th, 16th century. Brilliant artist. Um, he had an exhibition at Varken two years or however many years ago I was there. And it, it was brilliant, beautiful to see them. He, he's done Sodom, he's done a bunch of other things. But you could literally just, AI could just rip off his style completely and then render his livelihood um, just taken from him almost instantly. And how can it be policed or stopped or gatekept? I don't think it can. And I also sadly don't think anyone cares. That's the thing. I don't think the um, the needs or wants or um, livelihood of artists is really uh, going to be um, something that the well, let's call it the powers that be or the, even the people who have created this technology are really interested in. So I, well, we're getting near the end here, but I said... Um, I said to Paul, I mean, if I personally perfected a style exactly like Seagrave and painted other things in his style, there's nothing technically saying I couldn't. He says to me, yep, but you'd need to have a high skill level. Skill. Yeah, skill. There's the word, isn't it? And have some imagination to paint other things. Definitely. I don't think it's quite at the level to be convincing in specific artist styles, but text prompted AI has been developing at an alarming rate. It certainly has. I've been following it the last few weeks. Yeah, alone it's developing but without taking millions of images without any permission it wouldn't be able to do anything much artists do learn from other artists all do sometimes replication is part of that process it takes time to develop your own style same with music but it all depends on the different aspects of being human like experience imagination emotion that's really what art is and that's really what we're digging down to here is that ai isn't human it's not emotional it doesn't have a relationship it. it's just literally harvesting data and belching out other data to meet the data that you've inputted. Um, and there is no way to gatekeep it. We tried, we ran around a different few, a few different comparisons. Could they be tribute bands? How, how do we make sense of this? But I returned to the, um, the BBC discussing 320 million potential jobs lost. And I'm uh, again, now we see how this, we see when the torchlight is focused on the creative industry, on the art industry, um, it strikes me that there is, how could you gatekeep all of this stuff? It's impossible. It's impossible. Anyway, my friends, that's episode 155. I'm sorry to leave it sort of hang in there. Um, I had an awful lot going through my head today to try and get through and discuss this. I think I might try and get Paul on to at least talk. Um, I don't think he's a... He's a Zoom video guy, but he makes some very, very interesting points there in this discussion of of, of the replication of Seagrave's art. Maybe I can get Dan Seagrave on actually to discuss it. This would be a really good idea. Um, yes, that is a good idea. I wonder, is that possible? Because the implications are that we can just create these things in 20 minutes and you don't need any talent, any imagination, any skill. And no, you don't need any creativity really to 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 come out with something that is sometimes greater than those who are creative my mind is just it's kind of a bit broken with all this stuff lately and i have to admit sometimes it makes me glad um even you know it does not make me glad to be <laughs> aging of course but to have had a 30-year career um in creativity and music behind me but then again who knows all right, my friends, hunker down for the cyber attack. It's incoming. I'm going to go hang out with Uncle Joe and we're going to listen to Holocausto and Sex Trash. Over and out, Agitators Anonymous.